I got a question in the uh, break that made me realize that there's one thing I really did not make clear. So let me just reiterate one thing that I explained badly in the first hour that I want to make sure uh, people understand. So I said I want to explain again how you go from two-prover or multi-prover, but let's think of two-prover to delegation. Okay? So remember we, had a, we assumed we had a two-prover scheme where each prover had a query was queried, Q1 and Q2, and send back an answer. In the delegation scheme, we have only one prover. And to verify what he will do, he will send each of these queries encrypted. OK, so we send encryption, no by hat, encryption of Q1 with one public key, and encryption of Q2 with another fresh public key. Now, what does this poor prover do? He doesn't see these queries. How does he answer? So we use fully homomorphic encryption, which means what, what this prover does, he gets this box with this query, with query one. He does not see query one, but he applies a function to query one to get answer one. And what is this function? Exactly the function that this P1 does. OK, so he answers underneath the hood. He gets this box. Remember Shine's gloves or Je uh, Craig's gloves? Right, there's Q1 in there. He pretends the function that P1 does, he applies this function to uh, Q1 and gets back the encrypted answer A1, where he still does not, he has no idea what Q1 is or what A1 is. They're both encrypted, but he still managed to do the computation underneath the hood using fully homomorphic encryption. OK, and again, it, when, when this heuristic was uh, suggested, they didn't have fully homomorphic encryption. They had peer, but I don't want to go into, into that. So is, is that clear, more or less? Just to make, OK. OK, so thanks for, for asking uh, uh, the question. So I got a chance to clarify. OK, so where were we? So we said if we only had uh, NIP, multi-prover interactive proof, NIP, that is secure against no signaling strategies, we are done. We solved the problem of delegation. Okay, so let me just recall and give you some context of this notion of no signaling. So <clears throat> this notion was actually studied for uh, several decades now, starting in the mid-80s, and uh, it's inspired by quantum physics. So let me explain you what this notion is in the context of multi-prover interactive proofs. So we have a multi-prover interactive proofs, and classically, sorry, classically we assume that these provers do not interact at all. They're in separate rooms, they cannot interact, they answer locally, okay? Is that a reasonable assumption? I think so, you put them in a different room, they can interact. However, quantum physicists may disagree. Because they can say, well, you know, you can put in different rooms. For all I care, you can put them in different planets. But what if they share some quantum entangled state? Then they can use this entangled state to, to cheat the system. Okay? And indeed, now we know we have a lot of, uh, Kaimin talked about it, and we have a lot of work, uh, people really interested in trying to base cryptography or uh, more generally uh, complexity theory and so on, on uh, 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 assuming that, uh, that our schemes will remain secure even against these adversaries that use quantum entanglement or any kind of physical means. Okay, so we want to say, ideally we would want to say this, this MIP is secure even if these two provers that are sitting in different rooms sharing a quantum entanglement. Okay, we can go a step further and say, well, you know quantum theory is known to be incomplete. God knows what else they can do. Maybe there's some other physical means that these two provers can use to, to cheat beyond quantum entanglement. So I want to make sure that no matter what they do, they cannot cheat. The only thing I'm willing to assume, and here is Einstein here, is that information does not travel faster than the speed of light. So I know that they do not interact with their ancestors. That's the only thing I'm willing to assume. And this gave rise to the notion of no signaling strategies. So no signaling strategies just says that, look, I don't know what they can do. Think of these provers being really, really far away. So the very fast sitting in the middle, one prover is in Mars, one prover is in Jupiter, and he's sitting in the middle, and he's like, I don't know, they may, even though they're far away, they may share quantum entanglement, and God knows what else they can share, but I know that information cannot travel. 
between them. So I, I, the only thing I'm willing to assume is that this answer, does, he said, given Q1, this answer does not contain additional information on Q2, because otherwise, how did this information travel? Okay, so that's the concept of no signaling. No signaling says, these, what a no signaling strategy is a strategy that's not necessarily local. So the answer, no signaling strategy, A1 is not necessarily a function only of Q1. It can be a function of both Q1 and Q2, a randomized function. And the only thing, my only restriction on this strategy and the answer, on the answer, is that the distribution of the answer does not contain information about the other query. Or in other words, this answer is a random variable and the other query are independent. Or saying it even, maybe saying it differently, maybe I'll use this board. I'll say it in many ways because there's, it's a concept that's hard to grasp, so I'm just going to say it in 100 different ways. Uh, another way to say it is, so what's a no signaling strategy? It's a function. It can be a, a randomized function of both Q1 and Q2, randomized function, and it's no signaling if when you look at, the, at this answer, this is f for one Q2, and for another Q2, it's exactly the same distribution. So the distribution of these answers are the same. So the distribution of A1 is the same as the distribution of A1 prime. So don't look at the answer as a number. Look at it as a distribution. This distribution is, is not affected by the other query. That's no signaling. And more generally, yes? Are the distributions necessarily the same, or uh, do we want to say that they're not distinguishable? So that's a very good question. So no signaling, they're exactly the same. In our paper, it's not, that's not enough, because I want to use signaling to break the FHE, so it's the, the encryption. So it's not enough to say, you know, uh, security holds only if they're completely, completely the same. I need to leverage. So I'm actually using, we're using the notion of kind of delta no signaling. So. Our MIP needs to be secure against more than just no signaling. It needs to be secure even against tiny signaling. But not what? Not it's not like there's a computational. Like Actually, computation. you can think of it also. We don't do computational, but you can think of computational signaling. And I can talk a lot about that. But, but yeah, in our work, we talk about statistical no signaling. OK? OK, and more generally, here we talked about two provers. But actually, in our actual proof, we're going to have many provers, like K provers, okay, security parameter, and the requirement is that take a bunch of queries to, you know, Q1 up to QS, I don't know, to the first S provers, and look at their answers, the distribution of their answers. It's the same no matter what the other queries are as a distribution. Okay, so when you look at the distribution, you can't, you look at the answers, the, the random variable that corresponds to the answers, it doesn't give you information about the other queries. Okay. Why, why is it enough for you? Because you want to break FHE. Because I understood that this is like an information theoretic thing, this MIP, this no signal improvers. Yes. But yet, um, cheating provers kind of, I mean, in this world, well, this one cheating prover, he can do something where, you know, it's only computation. I mean, he, he has yeah. like more things. It's yeah. Like why is it enough? So, uh, so Evgeny's question is, why is it enough to have statistical no signaling? Uh, so the answer is, computational no signaling would have been better. It would give you LWE, polynomial LWE. With uh, statistical no signaling, I just know that an all-powerful person can, without the Q, so all po uh, an all-powerful person, uh, if, if you have a statistical no signaling, it just means that A1 are, are distinguished by all, by all powerful people, but these A1s are very short. Think of it as polylog. So all powerful is quasi poly. Okay, uh, good. So now the question is do we have these MIP that secure against these no signaling strategies? Okay, and again, just as a sanity check note, classical MIPs are the most, because here we really, the cheat. So, we have MIPs, we have quantum MIPs, no signaling in MIPs. In all of these, I'm thinking the honest provers are local. Okay, so there's no quantum, nothing in the honest provers. Now the question is, what's the power of the adversary? Here, we're really tying his hands. He's local, he only answers, you know, he sees his query and answers. And here, we have the uh, by fault no nooch result that says you can do all of an exp. 
Now, with quantum, I'm giving the adversary more power. I'm telling him, look, you can do entangled, you can have quantum entanglement. Now, let's see, so now, the, you know, it's harder. They, uh, the adversaries have more power, so it's harder to get security. And this was an open problem. What, what's the um, uh, power of this quantum MIP class? And there's been a breakthrough work, and breakthrough work in the quantum literature, quantum complexity literature in 2012 that showed that, again, the power of this quantum MIP is exactly NEXP. Okay? Now, in no signaling, we're giving the adversary even more power. We tell me, you know what? Use whatever you want as long as uh, you, know, you don't transfer information. Okay? Uh, so you can use any physical means that I don't know what exists out there. You can use it as long as you don't break, as long as you can't talk to your ancestor. I'm willing to assume that you can do anything, everything else. So now what can we do? And here is what's known. The frustrating thing is you can't do more than EXP. That's known. The slightly good news, you can do P-space at least. But even here it was frustrating because the runtime of the prover like in that I peak will P-space, it's again 2 to the S squared. So for delegation, we can't use it. Okay, the cloud will need to run exponential time. Why doesn't that follow from IP equals P space? Uh, it does follow from IP equals P space, but you need to, I mean, you need to see that IP corresponds to, to, to oh, okay, sorry, now I understand what you're, you're saying. So uh, the MIP is non-interactive, it's query answer, okay? But IP can be converted into no signaling MIP, so it does actually follow, but it's, this is non-interactive setting, so it doesn't follow trivially. Okay, so this is what's known. And uh, what we show is, we classify, we classify, we say it's exactly EXP. Okay, so we can do all deterministic language, and I'll tell you exactly what we show. We show that every determ deterministic computation, T-time computation, we show, we construct a no signaling proof where with uh, you know, the proof of runtime is uh, T squared, O tilde of T squared, the verifier's runtime is quasi-linear, and the communication depends only on the security parameter. And now I want to show you this, uh, the MIP. And again, I want to I want to stress, the po I mean, no thing is great, I, I, I'm interested in it very much, but I'm not interested because I'm worried about quantum entanglement. I want to do cryptography, I want to do delegation. And the reason I'm obsessed and I really want to solve this problem is because it gives me delegation. Okay. So now, uh, oh yes, Afi. Is the prover's runtime depends on the number of provers? No. So even if it's polynomially many provers, I'll tell you the problem with polynomially many provers: the runtime of the verifier depends on the number of provers. So that's where you pay. But the prover's runtime does not depend on the number of provers. Um, okay. So. Um, any more questions? So next we're going to do the construction. I'm going to show you how to construct this MIP. <coughs> okay. Uh, okay, but first, uh, just, uh, yes. The basic difference between the quantum and the no signaling is that uh, if you assume that only unitary transformation is possible, then you get the same thing. Wow, that's scary. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, I don't know much about quantum. But you know what, one thing I like, what, one thing I really like about the no signaling, by the way, is exactly these things. So, you know, you want to prove something is resilient to quantum attacks. I don't know about you guys, but as soon as I see the cat notations, I get, you know, stressed out. So the quantum, th the no signaling, it's very nice. It's, it's, it's probability distributions. So we can actually work on it. You know, we can actually do things without, you know, getting this, all these cats around us. Uh, so so um, you can think of it as an abstraction, actually. Uh, a nice mathematical, so for those who feel comfortable in math world and feel uncomfortable in the physics world, it's, uh, you know. If you assume that physics was Hilbert space and only unitary transformations were possible, then it's, I see. <laughs> okay, so just again, I want to do the MIP. Why do I want to do the MIP? Because if I have no signaling MIP, then I'm done. I just, I get my, my uh, uh, two-message delegation scheme, <coughs> okay? And this two-message delegation scheme is secure, assuming the cloud uh, cannot solve LWU, cannot break the encryption. Okay, so construction. Okay, so before, so, okay, now at this point, I, oh, first, uh, from now on, I stole uh, Ron's slides, so thank you. Um, 
so from now on things are going to improve. Uh, okay, uh, <laughs> the slides. Uh, okay, so. Uh, the slides are going to be nicer, but uh, I won't be able to give you all the details because just to explain what uh, really a PCP is or MIP is, it requires kind of a course, more or less. Uh, it will take me, you know, kind of a semester. No, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but it, it takes a lot of time. So I'm going to use a lot of things as black boxes and not explain, but at least I'm going to try to tell you where you'll know at least what I'm not explaining and what I am explaining. Okay. So I'm going to construct this no signaling MIP that's secure against my no signaling strategies. So let's start with construction. Okay. So what do the provers do? Okay, I have a bunch of provers. I'm going to have actually many provers, like security parameter number of provers. What do they do? They get an input F and X. What do they do? So first thing they do, they generate the tableau of the computation. So think of F as a Turing machine. You generate the entire tableau. Okay, so uh, the height is the time, width is the space. Here we have the input bits. The output bit is sitting over here. They generate this tableau, first thing. Second thing, they encode this tableau. They encode it using a PCP, a publicly checkable proof. I'm not going to explain exactly how this PCP works. Just think of it. You take the tableau and you encode it in a way using a PCP. What does this PCP offer you? It offers you, just as I'm just using PCP as a black box now, it offers you a way to read only a few random locations for the verifier, to read only a few random locations and be convinced that this entire tableau is correct with high probability. Okay, so you can verify the correctness of all of this using a few locations. That's what, what this PCP does. Okay, so they encode it. We use the bye bye fault no a Loon uh, Living Segedi PCP, but probably any other PCP would work. This is kind of uh, one of the, you know, um, classical PCPs. Uh, we, we don't. I don't think we need anything specific from this PCP. So you can, for now, think of it as a general PCP. So you encode your computation using a PCP, and you expect to be asked one one point. So you generate this PCP. You expect to be answered one query in this PCP, one location. You get back the number that's sitting there, the bit that's sitting there. That's it. And that's what the prover does. So remember before I told you that MIP and PCP are essentially the same? This is the MIP. It's just a PCP. Each one encodes the computation using a PCP and expects to get an, a question. Ask one location of this PCP. Okay? And again, I did not tell you what this PCP does, how it exactly encodes it, and you don't need to know for this to understand this result. Okay. How about the verifier? The verifier pretends he's the PCP verifier. So he just, he, there's the BFLS uh, 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 PCP, the verifier is there what it does. He generates a few queries, and think of it security parameter number of queries, and uh, he'll send one query to each prover in a random order. Okay, so we'll give each prover a query, get back the answers, and accept if the PCP verifier accepts. So he's just pretending, you know, that, he had, that he's a PCP verifier. One uh, uh, kind of technical point, but it's kind of interesting, is that we don't really use the PCP as is, but rather in the PCP, the, the verifier does many kind of consistency checks or many tests. We repeat each one k times. Okay, so we, does, we do some amplification. And this amplification is important for us. It's some soundness amplification. And one of the reasons why this amplification is very important for us is because with no signaling, for general no signaling, we do not have parallel repetition. So this is a way of getting around this problem that we don't have parallel repetition. We amplify soundness by repeating the tests. But for those who didn't understand it, forget it. It's not important. We don't know how to prove parallel repetition, or we have counter? We, no, we don't know how to prove parallel repetition. It's an open problem. We know how to prove it for two provers, well, maybe some extensions, a few, but we don't know general parallel repetition results. For no, no signaling. For no signaling. For no signaling. For, for classical, we have Ran Ra's parallel repetition. Yeah. Okay. So that's what we do. So essentially we do a, a, a PCP. You know, we take the two, the provers, each one gets PCP, we ask queries, get answers, we amplify by doing this thing in parallel, that's it. Okay. What's the analysis? So let's first, let me first tell you how the classical analysis work. Forget about no signaling. How do we prove that, that this thing is classically sound against classical attacks, classical adversaries that just see their own uh, query? So the way it works is the following. You say, well, if the cheating provers convince the verifier to accept, namely, they passed the kind of random consistency checks that the verifier did. Remember that a PCP, the verifier does kind of random, it queries from a few random locations and does some tests. 
So if these random consistency checks passed, okay, the verifier accepted, it means the, that the PCP must be, the tableau, you can think of the tableau, must be consistent everywhere with high probability, and then they go from local consistency to global consistency and hence correctness. At this point, this should be totally buggy or weird or doesn't make any sense to most of you. Why? What do you mean local consistency everywhere? So these provers, they generated, these provers generated a tableau. So they generate the tableau, I'm just gonna put in a long string, doesn't matter. I'm asking a few location and I accept a consistency everywhere? How do I know that, you know, here I have consistency? I never asked these places. So how can I expect that everywhere I'll have consistency? It makes no sense. So let me explain to you what I mean that you get local consistency everywhere. So you never, when you want to query a point in the PCP, you never query that specific point. Rather, you do a decoding. Okay, so you think of the PCP, it's an encoding of the entire tableau, and when you want to know what's written in a specific place in the tableau, you decode. You don't read the specific point. Because again, you know, the specific point can put the whatever you want, whatever you want, you'll never read it anyway. So you can, that, that won't, you, you'll never get soundness this way. So how do we, quote unquote, read a point? The way most PCPs work, the way you read a point, so this encoding is essentially read Muller encoding, for those of you who know a little bit about coding theory, and the way, so it's some polynomial encoding, it's, uh, and the way you read a, a point, you take a random line through this point, and you interpolate. That's how you, most PCPs work. If you don't understand, it doesn't matter, think of it as some decoding, okay? In our work, like I said, we amplify soundness, by repeating each test many times, the way we would read a point is we take k, k security parameter, k random lines through this point, we'll, um, and we'll take the majority. So we interpolate and take the majority. That's how we read a point. But what I want to stress is the way I read a point is by asking a bunch of queries where each query on its own is completely random. Okay, so I, even if the point is stuck here in the end, and then I read it by asking random queries. Okay, and that's why I can get local consistency everywhere and now also this high probability makes sense. The high probability is over the verifier's lines or the verifier's decoding, how does he decode? The local decoding, the randomness used for local decoding. Okay, so classical analysis, that's how, that's how it works. You go from random, uh, from random uh, kind of, that the random consistency checks uh, are good to the fact that you have local consistency everywhere, okay? And then they go from... This is usually done in the PCP setting where you have some stronger soundness, but the point is that the no signaling is enough to guarantee, because one prover doesn't know what, you know, the distribution of the answer can't yeah. depend on a point because that's a function of the queries to all the provers together. Right, so here actually when I'm explaining this, I'm explaining it's more in the PCP setting as opposed to the MIP setting but it's really the same. And actually in the analysis in our paper, we use the PCP, we use the, concept, we use the terminology of no signaling PCP as opposed to MIP. You can, it's a very interchangeable, it's really one and the same. You know, PCP, MIP, it's, it's the same creature, so it's whatever more comfortable. It's not so much the distinction of PCP versus MIP, but the distinction of a static object versus the no signaling. The no signaling is enough to make this PCP, te classical PCP technique work. Okay, good, so. Uh, Okay. Yes, so that's how the classical setting works. In the PCP, I, now, now in the no signaling. Now I, that's the way I said but not before is what, how uh, classical PCP works. That's the proof, okay, the proof. That's, that's kind of the high level, the two main kind of parts. What about the no signaling? Now our uh, adversary is no signaling. He has more power, okay? He doesn't have to be classical. So how do we prove security against this guy? So. Again, it's the same idea. First, we show that if he uh, manages to convince the verifier to accept the random consistency checks, then he must be locally consistent everywhere with high probability. And this part really using just the same PCP techniques. So again, I don't want to explain to you these techniques because it requires a lot of information, just takes too long, but the same techniques, it just works. You just need to work hard and it works. 
and our amplification lemma because we don't have parallel repetition. But let me, I want to just uh, uh, maybe explain this again uh, in uh, some other words. So remember we have the tableau. What do I mean by local consistency? You think of the tableau as uh, you know, a circuit, right? With uh, a la uh, layered circuit and there's kind of gates here. And, and by local consistency I mean that if here was a one and here's a zero, here also has to be a one, it's locally consistent. And when I read the value here and here and here, I read it by decoding. What's funny? Yes? Why do you need amplification? Uh, okay, I need amplification. You have like very good soundness, but here you don't care about good soundness. So. I need, uh, so that's the next. Why do I need very good soundness? So, what? Yeah, that's the next. Very nice, union bound. See, someone's listening. I'm joking. I didn't get there yet. Someone's just smart enough to jump ahead of me. Um, Okay, so why do I need, so I want here to get local consistency with very high probability. So I want to be everywhere in the tableau is correct with very high probability. How high? 1 minus epsilon, we think of epsilon as very small. Smaller than 1 over t squared. Okay, think of it as very small. Why do I want this? To go from local to global. Okay, so in the classical setting, how do they go from local consistency to global consistency? Let me first show how you, they do it in the classical setting. In the classical setting, it's super easy. That's the easiest part of the PCP. Let me show it to you in one slide. Okay, how do you do it? Well, okay, you want to prove that you're globally consistent. Globally consistent means everything is correct. Everything is consistent. What's the probability that you're globally consistent? Well, it's one minus the probability that you're not. Okay, that somewhere there's a local inconsistency. Okay, so again, think of the tableau. You can think kind of, each gate, 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 if everything is locally consistent, the inputs are consistent with the x1 of the xn, everything is locally consistent, then, then, then everything is correct. Okay, so the probability that you're locally consistent means that you're locally consistent everywhere, sorry, which is 1 minus the probability that somewhere you're inconsistent. What's the probability that somewhere you're inconsistent? Well, union bound. How many gates are there? We have a tableau t times s, so minus ts times this epsilon. Now if I take epsilon small enough, that's why I need the amplification. If epsilon is small enough, smaller than, you know, I take 1 over t to the third, then you're very close to 1 and I'm done. Okay? That's the classical. So the classical, all the work was in the first part. This part, that's all. Local to global, trivial. Okay. Now lo no signaling. What's going on with the no signaling? This completely fails. And why does it fail? This doesn't make any sense. What does it mean to be local consistency everywhere? Now, the adversary, his answers depend on, all the, on the queries. So you give him some queries, he gives you one answer. You give him other queries, you give him another answer. There is no everywhere. Let me maybe explain this, go back actually to our example of uh, coloring, okay? So take our locally consistent adversary who convinces us that our non-colorable graph is three colorable, okay? He cheats. He's locally consistent everywhere. If you look at each two, you, you ask him, give me two, two vertices, here's two vertices, black and red, good. Two vertices, green and red, so, but how can, you don't get global consistency from that. So maybe let me explain it. Again. So you're saying it's a PCP setting, right? What's written at one entry of the tableau is what's written in one entry. If I ask this and that or this and that. Exactly, exactly. Now you could. Exactly, in the, sta in the classical PCP, when I, re I, I can read a point in the tableau now when I know with very high probability it's 7, it's 7. Now I read the next one. With very high probability it's 9, it's 9. That's it. In the no signaling, this is not the case. In the no signaling, if you think about our three colorable graph, well, you have some graph. You ask these two, red and blue. You ask these two, green and blue. You, how do you get the global consistency from the local? Okay, now the answers are actually a function as, um, as a random, as a, it's independent, but it's as a function, it's a function of the other queries. And that's where this fails. So for us, this is the part that's actually going from local consistency to global consistency. 
That's the part that requires new ideas. That's why we need to depart from the uh, classical PCP. You need to think about completely differently and need to go from local to global using other techniques. Okay? Yes? If the computation itself was uh, like redundant, like think of a circuit which is resilient to noise or something like this. So in order to violate the global consistency, you have to violate many, many, many local consistencies. Like, would it make your life easier? Maybe? I don't think so. Because, um, well, yeah, if, if you could... If you had to, okay, if to violate global consistency, you had to violate local consistency, then the answer is yes. But often, even if you're resilient to noise, even if there's noise, uh, it, it, doesn't, it still doesn't mean that local consistency implies glo global consistency. So if you had a circuit where local implies global, then the answer is yes. But it was... <coughs> not sure what you mean. There are, there are like ways to compile circuits in a way that there will be like a super redundant such that you know the, uh, So I don't think the redundancy will help you here. If you think of three colorable Okay, let's take it offline because I'm not sure, but I, I don't think redundancy will help you. But uh, let me think about it more later. So where does it matter that you are only for X but not an X? Here you'll see. This okay. The, the, okay, getting local consistency, you can get for an exp. Okay, so I can find, I can come up with, uh, I, I, even if the language was, was non-deterministic, I can still prove that if you succeeded in cheating me, you have to be locally consistent. But I can't prove that you're globally consistent, that you're correct. And here you'll see exactly why. Since you have a construction that works for NX, and exp also, it's just that soundness gets broken? Yeah, so what I have, I'm showing that kind of the standard MIP with sound simplification, uh, it's, it, it, for non-deterministic languages, if, the, if um, the adversary is local, he cannot cheat. For deterministic languages, uh, uh, sorry, uh, for deterministic languages, even if he's no signaling, he cannot cheat, but I can't prove that if, for non-deterministic languages, if you're no signaling, then you actually can cheat. And there so, is an attack because you said... There's an attack because you're an exp. So where is exp used in the proof specifically? Here, you'll see now. Now you'll see. It's, it's, the, it's the part that I go from local consistency to global consistency. So now I have the MIP, and suppose for, I'm gonna, suppose that I have my adversary that he manages to convince me of local consistency, that, you know, he does, he cheats, but in a way that when I ask these three, he's locally consistent. When I ask these three, he's locally consistent. When I ask these, you know, this gate, he's locally consistent. I wanna prove to you that it means that he's globally consistent, that this is correct. And I'm gonna really use in a very strong way the fact that this language is deterministic, that this computation is deterministic, and you'll see why right now. Okay, yes? Global is really the it's just union bound, right? In in the classical setting, yeah. not in my setting. In my setting, it's not union bound because uh, a. You can still do union bound with the, with the number of uh, things that you're union bounding over are tuples, as opposed to. Uh, we have no way of checking this. So she's telling you in the graph she's locally consistent everywhere. I think. Uh, let's think again. Let's think again. Global. Think again of the three colorable graph example. Okay, I can, I can prove to you that the graph is three colorable, even if it's not. I can prove to you with probability one that it's three colorable, and I'm always local consistent. For any two, you look at consistent. It doesn't imply global consistency. So if I just repeat the same query many times, does it help? No, you, you'll repeat it. Okay. If you... Colors. Okay, good, good, good. So why? Uh, oh, good. Uh, so what you're asking, you're asking, well, it, the more questions you'll ask, the more your locality will grow, and it will help you. But you, how, look, if you ask the entire graph, then yes, if he's consistent in the entire graph, you know, you got a three coloring. So you can ask, give me all the colors. But the idea is you want short. <laughs> You, you don't want to, you want the proof to be short, you don't want the proof to be give me all the colors. So how local you are, so I say local consistency, okay, what do you mean by local? Local meaning I know, you know, is this local? Is this, 
well, how local is local? <laughs> you know, it'll, uh, so I'm gonna, we're gonna, gonna see that right now, okay? But the more, the bigger the locality is, the easier uh, our proof will become. And I'm gonna really use it right now, so maybe I'll jump into the proof and you'll see. Okay, so here's the first attempt to go from local to global. Okay, let's look at these. I know that it's local consistency. What does it mean that a local consistency? Well, this is consistent with the input, so this is x1, x2, and this is consistent with these, which means it's correct, the correct value, okay? So I know that by local consistency, what I have here is correct. Good. Well, but by no signaling, it means that what I have here is correct, even if I asked other queries. Because uh, whether it's correct or not, it doesn't matter on the other queries. It's no signaling. And here already I'm using the fact that it's deterministic. Already here, what do I mean correct? Think of the three coloring example case. What color is this red? Is that correct or not? There's no, there's not just no such thing as correct color. You, and here I'm really using the fact, is what's written here, is it correct, is it really x1 and x2 or not? Okay, by no signaling, it's still correct. Good. Also this should be correct to probability one minus epsilon. Same argument exactly as before. Now let's go here. I get local consistency with probability one minus epsilon. Now, if this was correct, this was correct, and this is consistent, then this is also correct. So I get that this one is correct, it's probably one minus three epsilon. Okay, okay. It's still correct, even if I didn't ask these queries, I asked other queries, because it's no signaling. And so on and so forth. In the i layer, I say, the same thing, I say, well, this, if this is correct with from probability one minus, I know, some epsilon i, and this is correct with probability one minus epsilon i, this is consistent, so it's also correct. It's probability one minus two epsilon i minus epsilon, and so far. And then I'll get correctness. Good, it's, 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 it's fine, but the error grows exponentially. Okay, so I say if this was correct and this was correct and I'm consistent, then I made progress. But I need both to be correct. And so I lose. I, I, my error doubles each layer. So it only gives me delegation for low depth computation. That's not good enough for me. I mean, that's fine. We, ha we knew how to do that before with the depth of D. Uh, but I want to go beyond that. <coughs> and again, I want to note that we did use the determinism to make progress because we always had the, you know, there was some anchor. Is this correct or not? We don't have this anchor in non-deterministic computations. Would it help if, there was, uh, if you knew there was a unique witness? No, it wouldn't because uh, a, it wouldn't, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, so that's not good enough because they are doubles. Let me show you how, the, how to get rid of the air doubling. And here I'm gonna go uh, to what you suggested, which is let's make my locality bigger. Suppose I had enough provers to actually ask them, give me the values of all these gates. Okay, so suppose I had like more than S the space number of provers, and I ask all of them queries, and I could uh, interpolate and find all these values. So I have a lot of provers like the space, which corresponds to the verifier running in a lot of time, like the space. Going back to my question, so if this thing was redundant, then it was, it suffices to read like part of this law, you know, uh, in all the world. Yeah, we're actually, we're using that. This, this kind of, I don't know if you guys anything, but if, if uh, We actually, we, we can make it redundant by, but we still, so maybe I'll get to that in a minute, but we actually, we use this technique inside. Um, Okay, so if, if, you asked, if you could ask all these queries to the provers, then now all this is local consistent. Okay, so you can, if, they're, if they're locally consistent, then what does it mean to all this to be local consistent? This is the input and this is consistent with it, which means it's correct. So you get correctness probability one minus epsilon. For the whole layer. For the whole layer, for the whole two layers, let's say. Now if this layer is correct with probability one minus epsilon, it's still correct even if it's asked with the next layer because it's no signal link, whether it's correct or not, does not depend on the other queries. So you're still, this is still correct. And with probability one of epsilon, this is consistent. Now if this is correct and this is consistent, then this is correct. So you get correctness, you paid another epsilon. Okay, and if this is correct, it's still correct if you ask the next layer because it's no signaling. This is correct, does not affect whether the other queries are here or here. Otherwise, it's signal what other queries are. 
and so on and so forth. So again, you get that this is called probability 1 minus 2 epsilon. What about this? It's consistent with probability 1 minus epsilon. So it's correct with probability 1 minus 3 epsilon. <laughs> okay, and so on and so forth. You go up, 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 up. You get the top layer is correct with probability 1 minus t epsilon. And so now as long as epsilon is smaller than 1 over say, t squared, we're good. This actually works. Okay, so we avoid the doubling of the error, the exponential uh, loss in the error. Unfortunately, we paid in the runtime of the verifier or the number of provers. Now the verifier, the number of provers is like the space, the verifier's runtime is like the space, and we got delegation for small space computation. And that was actually our first result. It was for only linear space computations. The third attempt, which I'm not going to talk about at all, but I just want to mention, is how to improve the locality. So I showed you if you had the locality, like the space, we are good. We don't want to assume that. And this goes back maybe to Benny's point. Uh, so how do you improve locality? I'm not going to say anything about it, because it's. Uh, but, but just in one sentence, the idea is that before you do the PCP encoding, when you have the tableau, encode each layer of the tableau. So take the layer apply an error correcting code to it. Take the second layer, apply an error correcting code, and so on and so forth. And then apply PCP on this tableau, and then code it tableau. Why? What, what does it help us? The, the only thing I want to say why it helps us is it's more redundant. Uh, and, uh, um, and the way, essentially what we're using here, we're saying you don't need to check the entire layer to be sure that the layer is correct. It's enough to check a random point in the low degree extension. If there's somewhere error in the layer, the error will propagate, and there have been a lot of errors in the extension. So you'll catch it by just reading one point instead of the entire layer. I know this is very little information, but just to give a sense of the things we're dealing with. Yeah, this is a totally naive question, but uh, you, you know, you're already doing a PCP, which is, which is already an error yeah. correcting code, right? So yeah. Uh, is there intuition for Yeah, that? so, no, uh, it's a good point. So what Vinod is asking, you already have a PCP. Why do you need to encode and then do a PCP? Maybe you don't, but we wanted to do this as a black box. It's very simple to do it this way, but maybe you can use, you're asking why do you need to encode again? You have already an encoding. Maybe you can use the outer encoding and not put in, maybe. But just makes, this makes everything more modular and cleaner. Okay. So this is, okay, that's all I want to say about the, the proof. But what I want to convince you is we essentially used a standard. We started with kind of an arbitrary PCP. Probably a lot of other ones would exist. It's kind of the standard PCP that's used for, for classical, uh, in the classical setting. And we proved for that for deterministic languages, it's even secure against no signaling adversaries. Okay, so against a stronger adversary that's not necessarily local, but he's still no signaling. Okay, and the prover's runtime there was squared because he ran in the... Tableau, the tableau can be kind of t times s. In the worst case, s, the space is like the time. So that's why the t squared here, the verifier turns out to be very efficient. In the PCP, that's just how, how it works. And the communication is very small. These are things that we get from the PCP. Yes? Comment on why this like, unique witness thing fails? Because it has to fail, right? Yeah, because it fails, yeah. It needs because you say it's inside. Because I'll tell you why it fails. How do you know that what you have there, in, what I'm saying, I'm saying I made progress. So the cheating prover, now I have the cheating prover, there is no witness, okay? He's cheating. I'm taking X that's not in the language. So let me just repeat the question. Rafael was asking again the question that I got, you know, did you ask it before? Yeah. Ah, guy, you asked it. Sorry, right. Uh, why, uh, what if you have only a unique witness? Why doesn't this work? So I'll tell you, let's try to see the proof and you'll see what, why it fails. Now I have a cheating prover. X is not in the language. We don't have a witness. Not one and not more than one. Zero is not in the language. Okay, we don't have any witness. And now you're trying to prove. Okay, look, he's not writing the witness anywhere. The witness is big. So you look at the one bit of the witness. Once the witness is, once you get a red, once you get a yellow. You read it with this query, you got red. You read it with this query, you get yellow. There, there's still no notion of correctness. You see, I mean, there is no witness. So every time he can lie, he each time needs to give you a small witness. You know, like a small part, and in this part he can lie. So I, it's, it's confusing because it seems like, well, there is a witness, there is a notion of correctness. But when he's lying, there is no witness. There's nothing there. So that's why uh, it doesn't work. Yes? Uh, you, you 
basic strategy was to split uh, the adversary into signaling or not signaling kind of. All right. Uh, what if this adversary is using some mixed strategy? So no signaling contains. No signaling is more general than classic. So no signaling. I'm saying, look, he can give me an arb. He can be classical. So just the function can be only a function of Q1. No, that's fine. No, I'm just saying, like when you do the reduction, I mean, you say that if this signaling, we get the equal of a G, all right? The reduction, the reduction from MIP to here, or what? what? Sorry, can you repeat the? Not from MIP to here. Okay. When you do delegation. Uh huh. So there, you say that either is signaling or is not signaling. Mm hmm. What if the adversary is like mixed in that strategy? Okay, no, no. So I, I, I guess good. So I want to say either he's classical. I sorry. I, either he's no signaling. In the reduction, I didn't say it's classical or no signaling. I said either he's no signaling or he's signaling. No signaling includes classical. So in the in the reduction, so you're asking the reduction from MIP to delegation. Yeah. Right from MIP to delegation. So the result, the reduction from MIP to delegation says, look, the the adversary either he's using a no signaling strategy, which includes classical. Classical is also no signaling. It's a, classical is a very benign no signaling strategy. You don't signal if you're classical. So either you use that type of of um, of, a ta of of adversary, and then you break my no signaling scheme because my scheme is secure against no signaling strategies. Or, or I'll tell you where it does come. Or use a signaling strategy, but if you signal, then I can't. This is not. This strategy could be dependent on the queries. Like which one? So I'm, I think of him ahead of time. He applies some function to the queries. This function that he applies is either, either a one signals information about Q two or it doesn't. If it doesn't, it may be in, it may be classical. It may be you know like it's just local. It doesn't signal information, then I break the no signaling MIP. If it signals information, I'm going to break my FHE because I got information. Yes? I don't know if this oh. is what John G asked, but what happens if it's signaling just a little bit? I mean, why is your. Um... Good. So the answer is you're right, I cheated. What I actually prove, I prove that my MIP is secure against strategies that signal a little bit. And now if you signal only a little bit, you break the MIP. If you signal more than a little bit, then you break the FHE. So my, our, actually, our actual theorem is that it's secure even if you signal a tiny bit. You're still secure. And if you signal more than a tiny bit, then you break the FHE. OK, so in the last 10 minutes, can I say something about memory delegation? OK, so that was very nice. But as I said, my, our original, so for those who lost me, you can join. Uh, <laughs> welcome. Uh, OK, so let's go to our original problem okay, of memory delegation. So now we have our user. X is not small anymore. X is actually huge, just an entire memory. He puts the entire memory in the sky. He keeps a short commitment to the memory. And now he asks the cloud to do computations for him. Okay? And he gets back the answer of the computation with a proof. And is a, and more generally, this computation can actually change the memory. And if it changes the memory, then he expects a new commitment to his memory, because the memory is now changed. And we want to make sure that this proof is, uh, is sound and that it has our efficiency guarantees that we want. What we get is actually, uh, as we talked about, the verify runtime only depends on the security parameter, independent of the memory or of the runtime of the computation. And there's very little overhead in the prover's runtime. So he's like, we think of F as a RAM program. And again, in this setting, RAM is very important because uh, the memory is huge. I think you can think of it as like exponential, you know. So uh, there's a big gap possibly between Turing machine and RAM in this setting. Okay. Uh, so prover takes time proportional to the time of the RAM computation. What about the initial? I guess you still need to give to put your initial data. I guess that's just like linear. I mean, there is no. You just you just give the data. Okay. You don't. Oh, you're yeah, saying this commitment. So yeah, so, uh, yeah, so let me tell you actually, okay, I'll tell you in a minute, let me first, yeah, so this is what I said, this is the theorem. Let me first mention uh, <clears throat> previous work on this regime, so, and this kind of memory delegation or sublinear delegation. So there have been works, uh, there's been work on memory delegation, which is very similar, it solves a similar problem, but there, the prover's runtime, or the, the cloud's runtime, 
always depend, he always needs to read the entire database. So even if you ask him an tiny part of the database, he needs to read the entire database. So that was kind of what we're trying to improve uh, in this work. And then there was, were a lot of related, um, related models, which Ron talked about, about interactive proofs of proximity, arguments of proximity, homomorphic signatures that we heard about uh, yesterday or the day before, the day before probably. And, uh, and then there were also there were a lot of um, uh, works on, um, on uh, sublinear delegation for specific functions. Okay, which I'm not going to mention. So, okay. So how do we go, how do we delegate RAM computation? The paradigm is very similar. Okay, we say, well, how about we do a multi-prover proof for RAM computation? And, uh, and then we'll convert it to, to a, a two-message delegation scheme, exactly as before. So that's, that's the idea. Okay, we'll do a multi-prover proof and convert it. So we learned something already that that doesn't work. We'll need no signaling. Okay. So our focus, this part to go from multi-prover to one prover, exactly the same. Nothing changed. Just use FHE. The focus is how do we get uh, multi-prover proofs for RAM? And note here, before what was nice about the work that I explained before, we very quickly stripped away the crypto and we remained in information theory land. That's very nice. You know. You don't need to run after simulators and stuff and assumptions and so on. You're in, theory, in information theory land. It's very nice. Here, unfortunately, we don't have this luxury because this is, this is not really a proof. It's still an argument. Why is it an argument? Because I delegated my huge memory. I kept some small hash of this memory. And if the adversary can find collisions to this hash, he can cheat me. So even though I went to the multi-prover setting, I didn't get my information theory that we wanted. But, you know, we got, um, at least we have many provers. Okay, so, so we, we, sh we do a multi-prover argument system, not actually a proof system. So this is a computationally sound proof. So an all-cheating prover can cheat us, but we show that a, uh, a cloud that cannot break our hash function, cannot find collisions, cannot cheat. Okay, so how does it work? How does our multi-prover interactive proof uh, looks like? So first, uh, going back to Evgeny's question, I just give my data. Think about, you know, there are many provers. I give each one my data, and I, I keep a commitment. What's this commitment? Very simple. It's just a Merkle tree. Okay, so I just, uh, essentially any commitment that's locally decodable will work. Okay, so what's a Merkle tree? Again, any commitment that's locally uh, decodable will work, but you can think, I take my memory, and I hash down 2K bits to K bits, and I go up, 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 and I, I keep my root. The root is my, my commitment. Okay. How does the, so, uh, how does the uh, no signaling uh, argument work? So I, it's exactly the same. Everything's exactly the same. Okay, you generate the tableau of the computation, you encode the tableau using a PCP, and you expect to be queried in a single query, in a single point, and you answer. Nothing changed. But what is the computation now? Before we know what the computation was, it was just the tableau of the computation. Here we have a RAM. And the computation includes read. It also includes write, but let's forget about the write now, just for simplicity. So all of a sudden it says, read this location. What do we put in the tableau? So what we put in the tableau, we put the value that we read, along with the decommitment information, which is kind of a proof that what we read is indeed what's in there. What's the decommitment? In our case, it's just an augmented path in the Merkle hash. Okay? So now the tableau is just you know, an AND gate, an OR gate, da, 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 da. read. What do you put in read? You put the value with the augmented path. And another OR, another AND, read. You put the value and an augmented path. If that's what you have, you do a PCP. Here's something interesting. This computation is not deterministic because there's these reads. So, but in the no signaling, we have only for deterministic. So it seems like paradoxical here. How does that work? I mean, look that you. So I mean, the, usually what before the computation one, there's the input and there's and or and or not. Here all of a sudden there's a read. He puts read whatever he wants in there. So there's kind of the read is kind of a non-deterministic thing that the adversary, you know, the cheating provers can put there whatever they want. There's some place of kind of non-determinism. Okay, because in the read, they actually put kind of a witness in some sense, the value that. So that seems like this may approach may fail. But here's what saves us. It's true that it's undeterministic, but 
for polynomial time people, it's deterministic. So either you find a collision and then it's really not deterministic and so on, but then everything breaks. But if you can't find collisions, you have to put the correct value in there. You don't have room for, for, to play around. So practically speaking, it is deterministic. That's kind of the high level idea. Yes? So who chooses the hash function? The, the client. So the client? No, so in the client, he first gives, here's all my memory <clears throat> and the hash function. That's, that's kind of the pre-processing, if you want. And then, you, but, but if, by the way, you can think also that there's no initial memory, and you just play over and over again, and with time, kind of the memory arrives. In which case, the first time, you just give a hash function. Anytime you can give, the, as mo the moment you start the game, you give them a hash function with the first message. It doesn't need to be kind of ahead of time. There's no uh, adaptivity issues or anything. So that's it. That's essentially, the proof goes exactly the same. Uh, the, to go to local consistency is exactly as before and local to global. Oh, yes? Does the proof have the notion in it, the right thing that's supposed to be in, in this read thing? And if so, can you do it based on a uh, secondary image collision? The actual second uh, so, uh, okay, so again, the first question was... Does the proof have the notion, does there exist in the proof the, the thing that is supposed to be in this... Uh, yes, yes. The, can you do that based on... Uh, ah. The second pre-image, can we do it based on second pre-image? Right, if you want non-adaptive, probably yes. Yes, right, yeah, so. If you want to verify the client to choose the function ahead of time, then you can do it based on second pre-image resistance, but if you want uh, an adaptive solution where the server potentially can affect the delegated function, then you can. Yes. Do you have a thing that's supposed to size T squared? No, okay, good. So Ron asked the question. What, so the proof is very, very similar. It's exactly, you know, anyway, it's very similar. You can argue everything, but now you get correctness unless the hash is broken, unless the hash is broken. But otherwise, the proof is the same. And what Ron asked, you still have the, I promised time O tilde of T, but the tableau is still T squared. And the answer is, if you have RAM, then if, if, you, if you have uh, this big memory, then you can make the tableau you can use the space in the RAM. You can make the, tablo the, the space in the RAM always very small and store things. Before you had to store everything in your Turing machine, now you store things in the sky. And the RAM can become very, very short. But maybe actually, to, given your question, after Kaiman's talk, who talked about parallel RAM, uh, when you, our, our idea was just you can assume with the RAM programs that the memory is always this, the tableau is very uh, skinny. But the price you pay for having a skinny tableau is you ruin your parallelism. And if you want to do parallel RAM, we can't, you know, then this becomes fat. And if this becomes fat, then we need to go to the third. To, here we're kind of in the CARA, I showed you the, uh, the way to get around the space issue is to use this error correcting code and so on. Here we don't use it because this is so short anyway. We don't even need to, I mean, it's okay to have this many provers. This is only security parameter. Because we can always assume that the RAM program uses very little tableau memory. Uh, but if we want parallelism, we can't. So that's kind of an interesting. Uh... OK, let me summarize. This is the theorem. OK, this is my concluding slide. So you know, we came across this uh, connection to delegation like two years ago. I think it has so many applications to cryptography. We're starting to get. Uh, some applications, not even necessarily to cryptography. So I have a recent work with Ran where we show connection to uh, hardness of approximating linear programming. Uh, and I, I, I just think that it has a lot of applications. It's a very simple notion. And so I encourage all of you to, to join uh, our forces and, and work on it. I really think there's a lot of things to discover uh, using this notion. OK. Thank you. Oh, oh, sorry. I, I, the only place I used LWE is FHE. I never used LWE. I just right. so you put and Peer actually. Just from FHE and C. Actually, from Peer even. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't use FHE. I didn't use LWE. You know, the reason I wrote LWE is because I don't really need um, a. Usually, when say FHE, assume you need circular security, and I don't need the circular security. So I wanted to, you know, to. But yeah, any I, we can do it under many standard assumptions. Essentially, it's not just. Uh, 
this previous? Uh, yes. Something about the hardness of approximation. How do you do this? Yeah, of a, a hardness approximation of linear programming, yeah. So um, a, what we show is we show how any, if you have a no signaling MIP, we, can, we convert it to a linear program. That's actually how the, um, I told you that it's, it's an exp, that uh, no signaling MIP is an exp. And uh, a, the reason it's an exp is can you, can, you, one can show, it was shown, that you can convert it into a linear program. And so what we do essentially, this is very, very high level, we take our, our uh, instance, any instance in exp, and we reduce it into a linear program. And so now if you could do like better space complexity or something to this linear program, then you have better space complexity for all of exp, which is unlikely. So it's just, it's just, a, it's just boils down to uh, transforming any no signaling MIP to a linear program. That's essentially the, the one sentence uh, answer. Yes? So, okay, so we have a rejection problem, but it's not a problem because we don't have, uh, we, we don't reuse it. We think of it as two message delegation. And it doesn't, we each time do a fresh query. If we re, we could have reused the query. We could have made it in one round and have used the same queries all the time, and then we had a rejection problem. So what, one thing you can do, we say, I said it's two message. Put one message ahead of time. Reuse it until you know something bad happens, and then you can do it ahead of time. But it's not really a problem because we're not relying on some pre-processing. So uh, sorry, this on the previous slide you mentioned uh, the work of, I guess, uh, uh, you know, Panos and Rosblum. Yes. Know. Right. Uh, publicly verifiable to message, so that's an improvement to your work, or there is some caveat as well? No, it's an improvement, but it's different assumption. They use multilinear maps. Oh, I see. So, so they improve in the fact that it's publicly verifiable, but the assumptions are less studied. Oh, I see. So you're saying for multilinear maps and the same you know, efficiency, kind of similar efficiency? Similar efficiency. And for M, uh, for multilinear maps? Polynomial so time hardness assumptions on multilinear maps. Polynomial. <laughs> oh, I see. So, okay. Um, so, so if you want to do RAM with IO and so on, uh, can you... Uh, so there's, there's uh, other results which I mentioned in the beginning that does delegation for RAM for IO, but it's uh, the secure, if I understand correctly, so excuse me if I don't understand correctly the literature, I, I'm not, I don't think I understand it perfectly, but if I understand it correctly, they get uh, RAM from IO, but the security only holds if the adversary cannot choose the functions uh, adaptively. So in our case, you know, so, so you, give, you give the RAM, and now the, you want to say that no matter what, func what function is going to be computed, he can't cheat. But typically, I'm the guy who chooses the program, right? Well, I mean, yes and no. I mean, you know. Can't you use complexity leverage? I don't think you can, because if you, the number of functions is unbounded. But, but, but you do it again and again and again and again and again, unbounded many. It, I mean, if you do it one time, yes, but it's less interesting because it's huge memory. The point is to do many computations, and it's unbounded, so it's not clear to me how to do leveraging. So what's the next major challenge? So this is like done as an area, or there is some <laughs> skills? Also? Okay. Pub do it publicly verifiable. Okay, publicly verifiable without multilinear maps? Okay. Like from LW? No, for RAM. The, the, uh, the Panet to Outbloom. But even though probably you can extend to RAM as well, I, I believe. So... Um, uh, I would say the main challenge is publicly verifiable under uh, standard assumption or try to go to NP, non-deterministic under standard assumption. I know Daniel and Craig may object, but still there's room for, for uh, work on non-deterministic delegation. That kind of uh, you know, goes around uh, Daniel and Craig's negative result. And in the statistical setting, because I, so like Ron, Ron mentioned something open in the statistical setting, is there anything interesting for people who don't do, want to do computational stuff? Oh, yeah. So, we, okay, the most important, right? The, the, the obsession of Guy and, my, and, and me. <laughs> Interactive proof with efficient uh, provers. You know, IP equals P space with efficient provers. That's the most interesting question, in my opinion. Just uh, it's, it's a uh, complexity theory, but... 
Yeah, exactly. Are there any load bounds? Like uh, two messages impossible? Oh, but no, but I want polynomial, uh, polynomial many messages. But, uh, yeah, for two messages you can do, and because you don't think that AM equals P space. But polynomial many rounds, P space, prove running time poly T, verify running time poly S. Yes. We know anything for AM? At this point, we know two to the S squared or something. Two to the S, actually. The muggles give two to the S. But not, not better. I want it. Oh, sorry, so, uh, for AM? Well, I guess it's, um, well, it's two rounds anyway, I guess. You can... Yeah, you can do, AM is just two rounds. And you just... Oh, right, that's an, yeah, that's a question. Did you have a question? Minimal assumption, say, for four message arguments, and like going... You're there. asking, can you do... Uh, so you're asking, can you do like a, a second pre-image or something? Uh, does anybody know? Can you do four message under one-way function? I would ask you. You're the one I would ask, actually. <laughs> I don't know of any negative results. Right, but the question can do it with less than collision resistant. One-way functions. So uh, perhaps you should take further. Yes. And thank you, Thank you very much.